We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and where are we? Where in the world are we podcasting from? (laughs) Somewhere different. Somewhere different, somewhere with reliable Wi-Fi, hopefully. Um, Yeah, so I am back in the U.S., which is really exciting. I'm back for six weeks, no longer in Argentina. I'm going back, so we'll go back to our unreliable Wi-Fi issues momentarily. But yeah, I am currently in Texas. Um, Got back on yesterday, Saturday. Yes. Uh, 17 hours of travel with my dog so that that's was so much a long ass day um and then when we got to dallas we had to drive like five hours to where my parents live south of dallas um yeah flight complication not a complication but logistics are so much fun um but yeah so i'm back and now we're only two hours different instead yes. of five which is so exciting for us and our recording schedule um but kevin you're also somewhere else where are you today um i'm i'm at a friend's house babysitting a puppy so i'm currently in the guest room you're trading your bed for a desk i'm trading my desk for a bed um and i honestly don't know how you podcast um without a like a desk and i I don't even have a television in front of me so i can't have a random tangent about what sport is happening live as we're recording oh my gosh no my my podcast setup back home is so so janky um but it works for me I don't it, know. it I just, we it, we're, we're getting comfy. we're getting honestly I'm like uncomfortable sitting at a desk I like don't know what to do with my legs and but yes I'm uh trying to be a little bit more professional in the podcast today for the next six weeks so yeah go team oh but yeah so speaking of being more professional um I got to watch this podcast or this um raise coming back from Dallas so I'm like sitting in the car watching it on my phone and like losing connection getting connection back because we're driving through the middle of nowhere um and I had to watch it with my parents which was always thrilling to watch F1 with them so that was fun yeah and then I I had my iPad with me because I had to leave after lights out to work one of the biggest gymnastics meets of the year uh, yesterday, Saturday. Um, So we're doing like all the prep stuff and I've got an iPad in my hand. I'm just keep, you know, I'm chatting with people. I'm glancing at the race. And then they're like, what are you watching? Motorsport. Oh, I know. I'm like, my mom's driving and I'm like watching the race. My mom's like, it's really loud. Can you turn it down? What's that noise? And my dad's asking me like random questions about f1 he's like did you hear that lewis hamilton might go to red bull and or might, no no sorry might go to uh ferrari and i was like yeah dad it already happened oh so it is okay so so who who left ferrari then i was like no one but lewis went to ferrari i'm like yes but i'm like for next year but how do they do that i'm like dad Welcome to the show. So we walked through that whole thing for a bit as I'm just trying to focus on Saudi Arabia, but it's fun. I I like explaining it to my parents. My mom has no idea what's going on. She just likes watching Monaco because she thinks it's a a fun race to watch and all the yachts and stuff, but my dad's kind of getting into it, so... Yeah, my dad is also into it. They're gonna they're gonna learn. Yeah, my dad's into it, and my mom is just happy watching what I like to watch, and she's happy when I share things with her. Um, so she she's gonna come visit me next week, and I think there will be a little bit of Australia that coverage that she will be watching with with me. Fun, fun, fun. I know. Now that I'm back, I'm like wondering what times races are. Like I have to switch my whole life three hours behind two hours behind daylight savings time is hard time um, is so but I'm hard. not gonna have my like nice comfy watch times like I'm used to in Argentina so well I think the Australia race times are actually pretty good um no Ar- Australia is better here than in Argentina yeah um and then China I think is yeah they're all they're all nighttime I mean it's it's gonna be a little bit later for you it's nine o'clock for me so it'll be like 11 o'clock for you um but oh but so not the worst be better than Argentina because Argentina then it'd be like one o'clock in the morning yeah exactly morning. Oh, yeah Australia and Japan are really rough for you when you're in Argentina 
I planned this trip so well. Look at me. Good go. job. <laughs> oh, well, always nice catching up and nice to uh, figure out my life while we're recording the podcast. Oh, uh, but Catherine, I know this is going to happen and I just don't want to, but I feel mm-hmm. like this whole entire season, we're just going to be talking about Red Bull and the circus that is Red Bull. And like, even with my dad, he kept asking a bunch of questions and it's just a lot, honestly. I'm, I'm going to say this, and I know that you're very happy to hear me say this, but I am sick and tired of talking about Red Bull. And I'm the Red Bull fan of this podcast. I know. I know. Um, but it's like every hour there's something new. But my one of my biggest problems with this is everybody is so excited. And this is this is a not a generalization towards like you know, legitimate media outlets. This is like the, you know, social media outlets who who portray themselves as providing news who are really like, they don't have the same like journalistic ethics as ESPN and Sky and all of the other, Euro- you know, European sports news yeah. broadcasters. Um, so it, so like even even today, there, there was somebody who posted, you know, breaking news, Christian Horner's been fired from Red Bull. And then, you know, that post, disappears and they're like oh that was just a rumor and it's like stop sharing rumors just because some like I can say oh you know anyone can say anything yeah I can say oh yeah Daniel Ricardo is going to drive for Red Bull next year facts and it's like you know what you know I I can you know you can't just say things just because it's like not not even just because it's newsworthy it's just it's you know you have to be more careful especially because we've had so much speculation these past couple of weeks which has been exhausting like this is it has gotten to a point where like you need to wait for official word yeah it's media literacy guys i know we preach this on this podcast i hate it so so much. much i do too and i just i mean I was annoyed hearing all of the Lewis Hamilton to Ferrari, who's going to be in the Mercedes seat, like speculation about seats. I will take that any day over this circus that is Red Bull. Yeah. I mean, if, if even like, you know, the other day, Helmut Marco made a power move to protect his job, which I personally do, do really think that that Helmut Marco very pointedly said that there was a theoretical chance of suspe- suspension. And if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to, I'm saying that in quotes, um, because what followed was the media immediately lost its mind. And then Max ha- then went on to respond of there's no Max at Red Bull without Helmut Marco, um, which I think was done on purpose to signal to Red Bull to back off, which, you know, immediately Helmut Marco says, oh yeah, I'm staying, Um, which is, you know, Helmut obviously did that on purpose and, you know, Helmut is staying as as of this point, Max is staying as of this point, Christian Horner is still staying. Um, Obviously it is Sunday. This could very quickly change on Monday. I hope it doesn't just because I'm tired of talking about this, Um, but it's, like we just need to move on and focus on the racing and, you know, keep, keep going from there. And I'm going to say this as, you know, someone who always loves a little drama behind the scenes during race season. But like, what the hell is going on? This is so absurd. It's so obnoxious. It's so annoying. And I just need the racing to happen. Like the drama behind the racing is fun when it's like, about the racing not when it's about like speculation and who said what to which news outlet and who's making up rumors and you know spreading them like wildfire but I don't know whatever I could sit here and bitch about it for hours on end and I'm sure we'll talk about it next week we yeah there, there will there, there will be something there will be something new next week but the thing is is that it's just it's time to focus on on the racing hopefully because we do have a week off between races things will quiet down um and by hopefully I mean it had better calm the hell down because I'm tired we're tired I'm very tired oh, before we get to Saudi Arabia I want to address the uh, appendix in the room <laughs> that oh, man. was formerly belonging to Carlos Sainz. Um, also, would really love if people could understand that, like, slightly feeling ill or, like, 
semi under the weather does not equal appendicitis. <laughs> a se- yeah. Appendicitis is you're dying and you're going to the hospital and getting surgery. So I just want to like back up because I picked Carlos to land on the podium because he's like, oh, I'm feeling, feeling slightly ill. Oh, I'm feeling a little under the weather. Oh, I'm leaving and getting emergency surgery to take my appendix out. Like drastically different. Would not have put him on my podium. But it's fine. I'm not mad. But um, like, can can we talk about the fact that everything surrounding the Carlos signs portion of this weekend has just been absolutely absurd? And like, like drivers get sick, but they still, you know, they still try to do what they can. That that's totally whatever. And these are all like, also like freaks of nature in as athletes. Yeah. So of course they're like I personally, my pain tolerance is is not normal compared to most people. I I can tolerate a lot of pain, so I can only imagine what type of pain and discomfort these Formula One drivers can um, deal with. And then the fact that you know he's the second driver in three seasons to go down with appendicitis. This happened to Alex Albon in twenty twenty. Um, so the fact that he was able to get through not one, but two whole practice sessions and then didn't actually go to the hospital until Friday at 1130, just hours, like five hours ahead of, of FP3 is bananas to me. When he was racing, like, or practicing for FP1 and FP2, he had like an insane fever. Yeah. What are you doing? (laughs) Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, go home. I, well, I, there, there's a lot of like, please, please go home in, in all of this. I just wanted to see where, where Oh, like when finished. he went to the track, like against yeah. orders from his doctors and he looked so unwell and so crippled. I'm like, Carlos, we are shell of you human right now. Please go home. Yeah. And like, I get it. You love the sport and everything, but you should not be standing up in the garage in the middle of the race. You should be like sitting in a hospitality suite in a corner with your feet and up. you know I'm just going to say it. I think that came from his PR team, not him, because he did not look like he wanted to be No, he, he it's didn't. Like a, let's show, you know, good faith that we're alive and we're doing well. And let's go to the track. And as but he's we like, don't slowly. need to do that. And, but, but also, like, freak of nature, he finished P6 in FP1 and P7 in FP2 with, with an ap- appendix that was about to explode. <laughs> and that's why he's going to, you know beat the crap out of Charles this year because he's so great. It does suck that he didn't get any points this weekend, especially if they're going to be close all season. Yeah. But, you know, Charles will do Charles things and probably hurt himself at some point in the points. So maybe Carlos can come back, but we're all pulling for Team Carlos, hoping he's making a speedy recovery. Really want to see him come back for Australia. I know that's what they're aiming for. Yeah. Um, which so, is it's it'll it'll be tight, but I mean Alex Albon had twenty days between surgery and and his return in twenty twenty two. Um, he he but was he had out of Monza. He did also have complications, and I'm shocked that he raced of all races in Singapore. You know, three weeks after major surgery. Um, fortunately, obviously Carlos did not have any um major um complications because he was out the door and at the race against doctor recommendations. I would like to emphasize again doctor recommendations oh um but clearly he was hopped up on the good drugs because his statement was one of the funniest things i've ever seen but i also like, think it's just carlos like he has a great sense of humor and he like yeah. is you know always joking and lighthearted and yeah, but, yeah. underwent a smooth, smooth operation, operation today and i'm feeling much better like i, ha- I have it just saved on my phone um it's and so good and calling Charles Lord Percival, which I know is a nickname of his, yeah. but just like everything about that was so funny. And then him and his dad taking that photo, um, recreating his dad's his photo, out. like yep. all of it is just like, Carlos is Alvon such a too. goof. Alvon being yeah. like, hey, Carlos, I got a good doctor for you if you need it. <laughs> Alex, you almost died. Oh my God. I know. It's so funny. But yeah, yeah. again, just hoping that he has a speedy recovery because and that he like actually takes some time to to like actually recover i know i yeah i don't know he'll probably be back in australia no i i I, I feel like he could take another week but yeah um but you know either way ollie bearman um was ollie bearman phenomenal i am his new number one fan Uh, actually i'll say number two behind his dad 
Uh, yeah. Oh my God. But, his dad, all race long, all qu- he, he, the race and qual- someone get that man like twenty stress balls because I know of he was he was stressing the entire time as yeah. he should have. Oh yeah. So to take a step back, I feel like we skipped a hundred steps because we just are obsessed with Ollie. So he is the reserve driver for Ferrari and Haas and Haas currently driving in F two. He actually got pole for the F2 race, but yeah. then found out, like... What? No, you're not driving! Uh, yeah, you're not driving. You're actually going to uh, take Carlos's place and qualified fairly well. He almost, like, beat out uh, Lewis Hamilton, which is insane. Um, and he actually did really, really well. And I'm yeah. so excited for him. Yeah, and I mean, we we kind of he was so he was the best performing rookie in the the rookie sessions last year. We saw him twice at Haas in the young driver sessions, um, and and we we knew he's good. We knew that. Um, and then obviously, you know, driving a Haas from last year is markedly different from driving the twenty twenty four Ferrari car that he had two and a half hours of notice. He caught the call from Fred at two o'clock on Friday. Um, FB3 was at 4.30 local. Um, he, he's like the first Ferrari rookie since 1972, which is a long time ago, even though in my brain, I think that's only 30 years ago. Um, and he's the first British driver to drive for Ferrari since like Eddie Irvine in 96, which was supposed to be Lewis, but then oh Ollie's God. like, excuse me. That meme of like the train and the bus where it's like Lewis Hamilton becoming the first British driver in like 30 years. And then it's just like Carlos's appendix. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I died laughing seeing that. So all good. all of, oh, all yeah. of the, those memes. And then of course the reminder that Ali Behrman was born the same year Fernando <laughs> Alonso won his first driver's championship. Um, oh my God. Cause... It was just like, it was so, such a good weekend for aging Fernando Alonso. Like all of yeah. the aging jokes of or dreams came alive. Like it was amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, and and he he drove, you know, after an hour's notice and, you know, a, a really solid qualifying, he drove one heck of a race and he like I loved at the at the end of the race when they showed him on um the the radio afterwards. I don't know if you heard this cuz you were in the car. Um but he immediately started debriefing. And he's like, oh, really? I could have done X. Yeah. He, he immediately was like, oh, I could have done this. I could have done this. So like, I, I I, love it. And he's like, like this very tall, like, he's 18. He's, he's, he's an, a un- baby. A baby. But oh. he drives like, you know, I mean, he beat Lewis Hamilton. I know. He drove really, really well. Speaking of Lewis Hamilton, I know you have your issues with him. But I think it was such a class act for him to be the very first person standing there. Oh, like, oh to yeah. Congratulate Ollie. Because like Ollie's 18, right? So all of the Hamilton glory years, like he's a British driver. Ollie's, you know, a British driver as well. Like Lewis Hamilton has to be up there as one of his, you know, heroes or someone he looked at oh, yeah. up to growing up. So for him to congratulate him on his debut race, like that's so, so cool. And I know Seb texted him and like said good luck. And all these people, I think it's so cool. And they're such great sportsmanship to see all of these people supporting a driver, not on their team, but just seeing, you know, a new young driver come into it and do so well on his debut. I think it's really cool. Oh, oh yeah. Every, like everyone wanted to see him do well up and down yeah. the grid. I, 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 I loved the, the clip of Lewis going and being that first one. George was right behind them. I think the funniest thing was all four British drivers on the grid finished one behind the other. It was Russell, then Behrman, and then Norris, and then Hamilton. So all of them <laughs> were yeah. together, um, which is just like one of those really fun, funny coincidences um, that just like tend to happen in Formula One, just like another layer of like entertainment. And then he was just like, everything about it was just so exciting. And he really proved that he is another one of these drivers who's not on the grid, who needs to get on the grid ASAP. Because imagine, like, if he knew for the full weekend he would be racing, right? Like, yeah. Like, if he had FP1, FP2, FP3, who, who's to say he couldn't have done better than P7? Maybe that's not necessarily true or fair to say, because he did struggle a little bit. But if he had two more practice sessions, like, maybe that would have helped Yeah. Him. 
like I know he really wanted to fight with Russell, um, who was yeah. ahead of him. And I mean, he would have absolutely loved to like go toe to toe with Alonzo. Like yeah. all of that was just it, there. There's so much potential in him. And you know how there's like a really great way to bring in more Formula One drivers. It's having more teams on the grid. But Catherine, why would we ever do that? Why it's would not we ever want to F one? Why would we ever want there to be a, an eleventh or maybe even twelfth team on the grid, which we talked about in one of our winter break episodes that I will link above if you're watching this on YouTube. Once I figure out which one it was, um, because I cannot remember off the top of my head because we've had a bunch of episodes lately. Oh. Yeah, I I would have loved to see Bearman fight with Alonzo just to hear all of the commentary around. The, how much older fernando is the age gap yeah 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 exactly but um but yeah no he was definitely stand out i'm glad he got driver of the day i think that's by so a massive and he got a huge margin too which is really exciting um someone else though that i was pretty impressed with and that after i say this it will mean more um was one of the Haas drivers yeah. <laughs> who were expecting to be like in the back of the grid. They actually got one point this weekend, but K Mags, K Mags drove really, really well. He like really followed team orders. He really helped give, you know, Hulk a good um, gap to stay in the points. Um, but he drove really, really well. I am sure that everyone who was stuck behind him in that train of drivers hates Kevin Magnuson's guts right now <laughs> because he like there there was one point where he, they showed him in the car and they showed him like deliberately slowing down to like push Ocon back mm -hmm. while working to give um, Hulkenberg enough of a gap so that when he ultimately pitted he wouldn't be caught behind everyone um, and just you know gave Haas room to keep that P10 um, but it was I am sure that that was the most frustrating race for everyone like it even got to the point that like Daniel Ricciardo and Valtteri Botas who were way way in the back like they even got caught up in it yeah. because he was just it really reminded me of Fernando Alonso's DRS train in Monaco last season yeah. um, where Fernando woke up and said I'm going to cause problems on purpose and and Kevin <laughs> and Kevin really did violence. that yeah yes no, it's uh it was a really good drive though from K-Mags I mean he didn't score points but he helped his teammate get a point so Haas is off the list of teams without the possibility to get points this season because they have one point um, yeah Alpine I, I don't think they're gonna get a point I, I think Alpine's best performer this year is going to be F1 Academy's Abby Pulling, but we'll talk about her in a few minutes. Um, I do also want to add, and this is something to know for, for this season, is Kevin Magnuson, he did this and, and really sacrificed his, his you know, finishing position for Nico Hulkenberg because he ended up nabbing um, 20 seconds worth of penalties. Um, one of them Jimmy was... Esteban Ocon to run for his money. I know, SD Bestie's really been good this year because this car is just terrible. But Kevin Magnuson, his first set of 10 second penalty was from causing a collision with Alex Albon. And then the second was he left the track and gained advantage. And I think this was against Yuki Tsunoda. Um, and that used to be a five second penalty, but due to the driver's insistence, it is now 10 seconds. Um, so putting himself in that position. He's like, okay, well, I got 10, 20 seconds of penalties on me, so I'm just going to ruin everyone else's day in favor of my teammate. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I do really enjoy K-Mags. I wish he had a better car, but... Yeah. I'm I'm a little bit worried. I think he is the, the most vulnerable Haas driver to losing his drive uh, yeah. after this season. That's just... That's kind of the, the vibes that I'm getting right now, and especially, you know... When Alex Albon's appendix went out, like that started a massive domino effect that led to Nick DeVries on the grid, um, which we all know how that went. And now Daniel Ricciardo was paid $18 million allegedly to not race and then ended up racing for, for Alpha Tauri last year. Um, so I'm really curious to see what Carlos Sainz's appendix, what that domino effect is going to lead to. And it could potentially lead to an Ollie Behrman at Haas. I can, I can see that happening. Yeah, I could see that too. Um, but I feel like if we're looking back to the the madness that was everyone moving around for 2023, um, I mean, that domino this year was Lewis Hamilton. Yes. For next year. Yeah. So, 
Because it was so Seb. It's a, yeah, it's it's going to be a it's going to be a, a one, yeah, the the Carlos's appendix is a step in the the domino effect that starts with Lewis moving to Ferrari. Right. Yeah. Cuz Lewis is the first domino to fall and now it's just going to I mean Carlos is the second cuz we're like Lewis is leaving, Carlos is leaving. So wherever Carlos goes, that's the second domino, but his appendix might be the third. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, oh god. So other Team slash drivers that that did not um, impress so much what this the heck this weekend. Happen is happening with our uh, team carbohydrate V car. Um, like, I don't know what what Yuki looked fine for a little bit. He did not look great, but he didn't look great. But no, Danny looked terrible. Like yeah, there's there's drive. something going on with that car that yeah. they yeah, need to fix Danny. ASAP. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was it was terrible. I hope it's um a along the lines of terrible. I don't think Sauber is going to have a one clean race of pit stops this season. I'm not no, they they're zero for two. And for two. I, but and I, the problem is, and I don't want to put this on the mechanics and the guys that are doing the pit stop because the both times that there have been an issue, it's been because they couldn't get the tire off. So there's something wrong with the car and like where, how the wheel fits onto the car. Yeah that needs to be fixed, which is a, yeah. a car issue, not a mecha- like not, not a, a pit stop mechanic issue. It's an engineering issue, not a mechanic pit stop issue. Yeah, yeah yes. exactly. But, but like to have back to back and we don't even know how long Joe's pit stop was because they didn't put the timer on it. Like they did for Botas in, in Bahrain. Um, they were running but, back into the garage. And that's never a good sign. No. And that's the second time that's happened where they've had to like take the tire into the, the thing to get the, the wheel nut off, which is bad. You can't. That, that that's not how that works. No, and someone was like hammering something like on the car. I'm like, oh god, this is not good. Yeah. But yeah Speaking of not good, um, Lance Stroll put it in the wall. Oh my god, he yeah he hit the wall, snapped the suspension, went into another wall. Radio calls. Oh, I hit the wall, and his engineer goes. Okay, yes. Um, can you bring it back to us, Lance? And like, if you are even watching any monitor, you see he's clearly in the wall and the car is destroyed. And they're asking him to drive it back to the pit. And he's like, no, I'm in the effing wall. I can't. The, the I delivery die. on that radio call was just next level oh, hilarious. So it is it is in I'm the lead for radio for, call uh, of the year. Yeah, yeah, that's my nomination currently. Two races in, that's number yeah. one for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Ugh. And then there was another retirement. Pierre Gasly didn't even make it a lap before they said, hey, we have to retire the car. He so, barely made it the, through the formation lap, which I will credit, whether it's accrediting Alpine or crediting Gasly's ability to get the car back onto the grid when he was dealing with gearbox issues, that could have very easily caused like a false start to the race yeah. and, and would have caused a, a, another formation lap. Because I think that when his car started having issues, he was it was too late for him to pull back into the pits. Because that's a, it's a really long track. It's almost four miles. So that's a lot of, of, of running that they needed to get to. So fortunately, he was able to, you know, start the the race was able to be started in spite of the fact that his car very easily could have caused a false start or an aborted start not a false start that was lando lando may or may not have jumped the start but he um didn't get dinged for it nope nothing further to investigate on that one but he he kind of did that (laughs) um but really quick before we move away from alpine i i wanted to to talk um bring up this one point of um going back to their liveries which we do not love um that it's so hard to tell you know the the pink livery versus the blue livery because they basically look the same and my dad and I were talking when I was on my way home and he's like you know they need to just like put the Pepto-Bismol back on the car and then I was re-watching the end of the race just to to hear all the the commentary that I that I missed at gymnastics and I, I saw a clip of Akon's car driving in that train and it was like wait a minute they're running the pink livery right now but it doesn't look like it. Had no idea. Had no idea. You can barely so tell. Dumb. I hate it. Yeah. I hate everything that they're doing right now. I just yeah. don't understand it. But on a more positive note, mm-hmm. someone did really well in predictions this weekend. Someone got a sweep. Yeah. Well, 
Someone equated appendicitis to slightly feeling ill, so. <laughs> Oops. <sighs> okay, so let's recap our our race predictions here. Because honestly, the Saudi Arabia was kind of a nothing burger besides Ollie Bearman. Yeah. Like, that was the big story. I mean, Max did Max things. Checo, you know, got second. He got a penalty, but he was still in second. Charles was the next fastest driver, and that's your podium. Like, there was nothing exciting going on at the top. All the excitement, honestly, was from, like, seven on down. Seven to, like, 14. Like, that's where the action was. That's the entire race that we saw on the broadcast. Yeah. Um, so Though we I, haven't talked about it, but another one of those bits was Oscar Piastri stuck behind Lewis Hamilton for half yeah. the race, and he was just, yeah. like, miserable about it. One, two quick things that I want to add for Verstappen is he's the first F1 driver to win nine races twice, um, and this was his 100th career podium. And then for Perez, um, he was um, – this is his first back-to-back podium finishes since Hungary and Belgium in 2023. So other than that, there's really nothing else to know. We have our like, here's all of Max's accomplishment section of the podcast. (laughs) Yes. Well, I didn't put that section in because we had like 8,000 other things to talk about today. Uh, Including our race predictions. So again, to pump up Max more than he needs, um, he did win and he did take pole, which um, this you is had a point for that too. at Jetta. Yes. Yeah. yeah so yes. it's kind of a riskier pick, not really, but a little bit of a risk for us. We both p- picked Max and we both got Max on pole. So we each get a point there. Um, and then for podium, like we said, it was Max, Checo, Charles. Five points. And Catherine got it perfect. So she gets five points. I had Max, Checo, Carlos. And I Oops. feel like if he wasn't getting emergency surgery, he would have been there. Yeah. But it's fine. I'm not mad. Um, and then but you're, P10, this is me last week. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I know. And then for P10, it was uh, Hulkenberg, who you picked. So you get three points. I have you. Thank you, K-Mags. Ended up, uh, P15. So oh, that's, a, that's such a hard pick for me. It's so it's, it's a hard pick in general. I'm it's the, a crap the shit, that, honestly. I think it relies yeah. a lot on qualifying and, and who you get stuck behind down there. So, I don't know. And like I said, I picked Hulk based completely off vibes. Um, but clearly, I've got to keep picking off vibes well, if it's going to go this well for me. That well. No, he didn't. He's like up there because he qualifies semi well, but he didn't even make it in, or he had uh, car issues. Yeah. So he didn't he, get he, to Q3. Yeah, no, he he didn't at all. Um, yeah, it was yeah. I I have no idea how I managed to to do a prediction sweep, but yeah, cool, okay. But there we are. Um, biggest surprise you said Williams is going to get finished in the points. They nope. did not, and I said Merck will improve. They did not. Nope. So. <laughs> Lewis Hamilton got beat by an eighteen year old with one hour's experience in the car. Don't just blame him. I think there's some issues with the car. So. No, they they did come out today and said that there's fundament, fundamental <laughs> issues on slow speed corners, which are we surprised? No, no. we're not. Yeah. And then who's going to do a dumb? You said Aston Martin with an iffy strategy. Mm, Stroll going no. through the wall would be a really interesting strategy coming from Aston Martin, but um, I think the strategy was better. Alonso had a decent weekend i mean i wouldn't say it's amazing but he also didn't have he had a solid point strategy finish that he had which last week so yeah it was fine um and then i said charles is gonna you know for lack of a better term should shoot himself in the foot and uh he actually he didn't. didn't he got p3 so no i feel like ferrari does it those. like ferrari doesn't know how to like cause problems on purpose when their drivers aren't fighting each other Exactly. That's what it really feels like because they're, no, they, you know, all of all of it was like, Ollie, just have fun, get used to it, take your time. You know, all Fred told him was like, bring the car back in one piece. And and Charles, you know, he ran his race. He was kind of in no man's land just based on how the the top positions ended up being. I mean, Max only won by thirteen seconds this time, not twenty two. So there's that, but. There, there were a lot of, of gaps in there, which makes sense because that track is so, it's such a long track. It's a really long track, yeah. I feel like, again, going back, if Ollie would have had the whole entire weekend to practice and race, and if he would have qualified higher and would s- remotely be close to challenging Charles, I think it, Charles would have put himself in the wall. 
Probably. Yeah. Yeah. The, it's, it's the you pressure know I mean? of like, the opposing teammate. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, well with this second race weekend, uh, you have 10 points and I have two. So I have a lot of room to, to improve there, but we have a lot more races. We have 22 races left. So there's still time. Yes. I believe in you. <laughs> I've got a lot of time. I'm really good at picking pole. Other than that, I'm not doing so well, but we will see. Um, yeah. Something else super exciting that happened this weekend was the first race of the season for the F1 Academy. So we don't pick anything for these races, but we do want to do a quick recap for you guys because it is exciting. They only have seven race weekends. So on those seven race weekends, we will be doing an F1 Academy update recap for you. Um, so Catherine, as our you know resident F1 Academy expert, I will say, um, what what were highlights from the academy's first weekend in uh, the season? So it was it was actually a really solid weekend. They came out the day after we released our 2024 F1 Academy season preview episode with um, the announcement that F1 Academy races will be, you know, airing internationally all year long. So they are, you know, F1 TV, they're available on ESPN plus, you know, literally if, if, if you have an opportunity to watch or stream sport in your country, you will be able to watch the F1 Academy, which is huge, huge news. And, and it, it really, and even if you don't, if you have access to YouTube, they air all the races on their YouTube channel as well. Um, and I think that the the broadcast um, was really good. I think that the broadcasters um, have a little bit of work to do with like, you know, connecting with the producers and how the production is going to go. Cause there were a couple of times where they were caught off guard with like the replay that they didn't expect or not getting a replay that they were looking for. Um, so they definitely improved throughout the weekend, but there's still a little kind of quirks in the broadcast that they're working on. But they're like, kinks. I think it's like a, it's a, like a weekend. give them time thing. Cause these yeah. are all very experienced broadcasters in the sport. One of them is of course, Martin Brundle's son, Alex Brundle, who sounds just like his dad and it's bananas to me how much like it's it's like the same person but not um race one also happened to land on international women's day um and dorian pond who is the mercedes driver she absolutely ran away with that race um abby pulling who is the alpine driver she did everything she could to to you know take the fight to her um and then maya vuk um for ferrari she was like just hanging out back in in p3 um and it was it was a you know it, it could very well be a long season in the um dorian Pond kind of world uh because she's she's really good. I'm not going to say that she's the Max Verstappen of the F1 Academy because she is her own, you know, driver, but it it could very well be we're going to be seeing a lot of of Pond pulling and Boog on the top of the podium if they qualify the same way that they've been qualifying. Yeah. Highlight for me personally was Susie Wolf waving the checkered flag. I yeah. mean that's just like amazing. This is I want to just say like this is Susie Wolf's circuit <laughs> yeah because or her series because it pretty much is hers she runs it she's the you know managing the director keeps it all together yeah um yeah that's a more official title than the glue um but I think it's great that she we have the checkered flag super cool she was you know posting all over um for the entire race weekend and I we got to see uh, some good behind the scenes stuff from her so I just love everything she does so yeah, good. and I, th- I thought it was really great that we had a bunch of female Mercedes staffers who were at the podium to support Pawn, um, and also just, you know, International Women's Day, like, you know, all, all of the, the women that were there to support, like, that was that was a really great show show to see. And then I, th- I really think that, you know, throughout the entirety of the weekend, we've been seeing similar shows of support from all of the teams. So, you know, yes, yeah. it's a great marketing strategy um, to, you know, have more women involved, but I think that they've really been, you know, 
the, especially the F1 teams who are who have drivers in their academies are really taking it to heart. We've had, you know, um, Hamda Alquabasi and Leah Block have been involved in, you know, race weekend social media with the F1 guys. Bianca Bustamante was invited to one of the F1 drivers driver briefings. Um, so they've they've really had some some great involvement that I I am really excited to see how that continues throughout the rest of the season, especially because you know they'll they'll be popping up sporadically since there's only seven races of F1 yeah. Academy as opposed and to I 24 love, for the men. I love to see the support from the F1 drivers as well. Like, again, say what you want about Lewis Hamilton. But he's so good for this sport. It was great. And he was there supporting and a bunch of the drivers were there taking pictures and at the races and supporting, you know, their Academy driver, which I think is great. You know, that's, yeah. I, it might seem like a really small thing, but still having them, be involved, show support. It helps grow. It helps put eyes on it. Again, eyes, money, growth. That's like yeah. You know, what we Toto Wolf was about. there. So, Zach yeah. Brown, who's the head of McLaren, he was out there watching the, the you know the first race. Um, the like half of the um, RB team was out there supporting their driver Omna Alquabasi. Um, so there there were a lot of you know shows of support from these people on the grid who didn't have to be there that early because all right. all of this stuff happened before or mo- before and after, but mostly before. Um, but race two. Um, started off a little bit of worry that Dorian Pun was going to just run away with the championship. Um, but she unfortunately lost position because she took the checkered flag twice because this no one told thing. her that the race ended. And so she was given a 20 second penalty that dropped her to P9. Yeah. So dumb. Like how, how do you take the checkered flag twice? How does your team not communicate? How does your team not keep track? Like what is going on? Who's on the radio? Yeah, the, like she was just like, it doesn't surprise me that she wasn't aware because she was so focused on right. on the race and the racing, you know, she set the fastest lap of the race, um, you know, on the on the last lap. So, you know, she was really in and focused on the fact that like, no one told her. Um, it was just like, Prem has got a little bit of work to do to, you know, get that, you know, figured out. Um, but yeah, but on, on a positive side, it advanced um, Nerea Marti. She's our first new podium finisher. She's driving the Tommy Hilfiger car. Um, so it is, Love you know, her. it was not it not great, but also it was, you know, nice to see someone different on the podium just because, you know, we're probably going to have the same podium a lot this season. Yeah, and I know for, so again, going back to what we were talking about for in our F1 Academy preview episode, each race is going to have a wild card entry for like a local Mm -hmm. uh, driver. Um, So how did our wild card entry do? Did she do well? Was it like way off base? She shouldn't have been racing or how did, how did her weekend shake out? Oh, she had a, she had a solid week and she, unfortunately she DNF due to damage in race two, um, which re- really sucked because she was, she, she was actually really solid. She finished just outside the points in race one. Um, and I think she, she also was involved in a, in a crash in, in the first race. So she, you know, all had, she had a clean week and I think she could have definitely scored points in both races. Um, but they also did talk on the broadcast about, you know, kind of how she got connected with Susie Wolf and how she, you know, ultimately became the the wildcard entry is like, she met Susie years ago and was like, Hey, I want to be a driver. And so Susie was like, here's, you know, here's how you start. And then yeah. didn't expect to hear from her again. And then she like called her up and said, Hey, I'm driving now. I, or I've, I've got my, my licensing. What do I do next? And now she's got her, you know, her own motorsport team. Um, she's so cool. Yeah. So, so it was really cool. And really like that, Further goes to it, you know, to confirm to us, um, based on what we, were, what we were talking about for the season preview, that she, you know, she was the right choice to be the Saudi Arabian representative in Saudi Arabian wildcard entry. Oh, definitely. I'm sure having ties to Susie Wolf didn't hurt her chances of becoming the wildcard oh, entry. Oh, of course. But a great entry nonetheless. 
Yeah. And then constructors wise, um, cause I mean, we talk about these drivers and we talk about like the F1 teams that they're associated with, but they have real teams that they're driving right. with as well. Yeah. Um, so Prima racing, um, they came away, um, from the weekend with 73 points, um, in the lead road and motorsport is in P2 with 60 compost racing who was, they were in the, the kind of the back of the bus, um, in 2024, uh, three, they are, um, in P3 right now with 35 points. And then we've got ART Grand Prix with 24. And then last but not least, we've got MP Motorsport with 16. Um, there are so many points up for grabs for a weekend though, yeah. that I think that we're going to see a lot of movement probably between two through five. I think that, that Prem is, you know, I really think- well on their way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, we're going to see a lot of change, a lot of movement in those, those middle positions. And it's a lot easier to overtake in F1 Academy compared to F1 because the cars are so much smaller. So it really, it, it makes, makes things a lot easier to, um, to have a lot more overtakes in, in these races compared to, you know, the, the big boys. Yeah. And I no, do I'm excited to watch, I'm, I'm excited to watch the you know next six races for their season I obviously was traveling and all over the place this weekend so I didn't have time to catch it but I'm glad that they're showing it on ESPN and we can actually watch the races this year we don't have to like deep dive into the dark interweb to be able to see anything so I'm really looking forward to seeing it like you said a lot of action happens because there are so many points available so constructors is just going to change I feel like the whole season yeah, and then they're going to be off for the next few weeks, and we will see them again at the Miami Grand Prix in May, um, which will be the home races for Williams driver Leah Block and Haas driver Chloe Chambers, who I think Chloe Chambers was my kind of biggest surprise from from the weekend. She, I think, is um, P5 or P4, P5 in the Drivers' Championship. She, she's really up there. She might have a better season than the rest of Haas, to, you know, once once that all kind of shakes out. Um, I mean, Abby Pulling is also going to have a better season than Alpine does just flat out. Um, but it's, so we'll, we'll see them. I don't think we're going to see a wild card entry um, in Miami because we have two American racers. Um, so we'll probably have a break on that until we go back, we go back to Europe. Yeah. Speaking of Abby, I think our, um, and just Alpine struggling, I think um, Ollie Behrman might have more points than the entire Alpine team this year. <laughs> That is true. I mean, Pierre Gasly is currently 21st, 21st. in the 20 driver championship. Yeah. God bless him. God bless him. Well, eventful weekend. Lots happening in Saudi Arabia. We do have a week off and then we go to Australia. Yes. yes. Oh my yes. gosh. Where am I in this universe? Yes, yeah, so we have a week off and then we go to Australia. So we will have another podcast coming out next week. Oh, we definitely did not talk about this before we <laughs> we started recording. I left this blank and then for, we I'm forgot like, to talk about maybe? it. No, because, well, okay. We'll we will have, we, we'll have an episode <laughs> next week. We don't know what it is yet. There's no Catherine's F1 fun fact because there's been like 800 F1 fun facts through Ali, Ali Behrman. So just like rewind the episode to when we were talking about him. It was such a week, weekend of first. Yeah. Lots of things happened. Um, but yeah, eventually we'll get another podcast out to you. Most likely it'll be our, our Australia preview. Yeah, maybe we'll sneak something in. Maybe we'll we'll maybe we'll have time uh, to do a fun F one hundred one. Yeah, you guys, guessing. <laughs> we we will we will let you know when the episode drops. When our let next you know episode. when we know. <laughs> yeah. Well, that has been our Saudi Arabia Grand Prix recap. That's the end of the podcast. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.